So hello, my name is Anna and I'm an undergraduate student studying biochemistry at the University of Bath and I'm currently on my industrial placement year working as a member of the target validation group at LifeArc. And today I'll be talking about the work I've been doing on the EIF for A1 project, focusing on the CRISPR-Cas9 knockout assay that we have developed. So in summary, I'll be talking about EIF for A1 and its implications in breast cancer. I'll then briefly outline the previous genetic target validation carried out on the project, including the generation of lentiviral shRNA knockdown clones, and what led to our decision to use CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to develop a rapid knockout transient lethality assay. Finally, I'll talk about the conclusions we were able to make from this investigation. So who is LifeArc? We are an independent medical research charity, and our aim is to help early, advance early stage drug discovery towards treatments and diagnostics for patients. LifeArc Centre for Therapeutics Discovery is based in Stevenage, where we have approximately 80 discovery scientists working in one of our three teams, biology, chemistry, and biotherapeutics. We house state-of-the-art equipment, which enables us to carry out each of these steps to help advance efforts in developing novel therapies for patients. So EIF4A. EIF4A stands for Eukaryotic Initiation Factor 4A, and it has two isoforms that are involved in translation, EIF4A1 and EIF4A2, or simply A1 and A2. This diagram here shows how EIF4A forms part of the EIF4F heterotrimeric complex. A1 is an ATP-dependent RNA helicase that controls translation initiation and unwinds highly complex secondary structures in the 5' untranslated region of mRNA for example, G quadruplexes. Unwinding of mRNA is required for binding of the ribosome to allow translation to proceed. Many genes that depend on A1 for translation contain these structures in their mRNA and includes a long list of oncogenes, such as CMYK, CDK6, BCL2, and MDM2. Overexpression of A1 is observed in many cancer cell lines and has therefore been investigated as a potential anti-cancer target. This paper here highlights the benefits of inhibiting A1 in estrogen receptor positive breast cancers, prompting us to carry out target validation of A1 in the ER positive breast cancer cell line MCF7, as well as in the triple negative breast cancer cell line MDA MB231. Data from our bioinformatics studies that were carried out by the Milner Institute support the association of A1 overexpression with poor outcome in hematological and breast cancers, as well as in glioblastomas. EIFRA has several existing natural product inhibitors, including sylvestrol, which demonstrates potent pharmacological anti-tumor activity in many cancer cell lines. However, sylvestrol is not specific for EIFRA and is thought to be non-selective for EIF4A1. A company known as Effector Therapeutics have recently developed an EIF4A inhibitor called Cetotifin, which is based on the structure of another EIF4A inhibitor called Elatol, and it's currently in the initial phase of clinical trials in patients with KRAS or RTK mutant solid tumors. Prior to carrying out CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, lentiviral shRNA knockdowns were generated and clones of the greatest protein knockdown were selected and isolated over three months. The proliferation of the clones was reduced compared to the unselected whole population. However, the results from the clones were variable and cells remained viable. Therefore, we recently generated CRISPR knockouts to enhance the data from the shRNA knockdowns as it provides a method to rapidly characterize a gene knockout at the genome, protein, and functional level. A recent collaborative study carried out by the Broad Institute and the Wellcome Sanger Institute, known as the Cancer Dependency Map, or DEPMAP project, involved profiling hundreds of cancer cell line models for sensitivity to genetic and small molecule perturbations. Their data shows that functional studies using RNAi and gene knockout do not always correlate. 
Therefore, we decided to investigate the effects of generating knockouts using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to obtain well-defined data to support the target validation of EIF ray one and A2. Generating knockouts would also inform us if an A1 knockout is lethal to the cells and if it would be possible to select for A1 knockout clones. So I'll now take you through the rapid transient lethality assay that we developed. For this assay, we utilized Synthego's multi-guide, multi-synthetic guide RNAs, targeting the genes for A1 and A2 in both breast cancer cell lines. Synthego's multi-guide approach includes the use of up to three chemically modified synthetic guide RNAs that are used to knock out the gene of interest. The guides are represented here by the gray bars. The synthetic guide RNA molecules are capped by a chemical modification to reduce degradation and increase editing efficiency. The guides generate double-stranded breaks as shown by the vertical dotted lines, which induce fragment deletions of 21 base pairs or more. The guide spacing and direction is also taken into consideration when designing guides that will generate the most efficient knockout whilst also keeping off-target effects to a minimum. Other guide RNA methods, such as the use of single guide RNAs, result in the generation of indels, which may not always result in successful knockout of the target gene. Whereas data generated by Synthego show that, that using multi-guides results in successfully knocking out the gene using their multi-guide approach. So for the assay, Firstly, I generated Cas9 guide RNA RNP complexes before adding the preformed complexes to the resuspended cells. I then electroplated the cells using the neon transfection system before plating the cells into 12 well plates. The plates were then incubated to different time points and collected for sequencing and indel analysis, analysis of protein expression, and finally, for carrying out various phenotypic assays to evaluate the effects of knocking out one or both of the genes. And I'll now talk about each of these three in a bit more detail. So firstly, I collected the CRISPR edited cells at three different time points to determine at what point editing had occurred. The DNA was amplified by PCR before the PCR products were verified, purified, and sent off for Sanger sequencing. I then input the sequence data into Synthego's ICE analysis tool, which stands for Inference of CRISPR Edits. This tool generates all the possible editing outcomes and determines their relative proportions. So this table shows here, shows the indel analysis of the cells collected 48 hours post gene editing. The indel percentage represents the percentage of sequences that contained an indel whereas the knockout score represents the proportion of cells that contained a functional knockout. This either occurs when there's a frame shift indel, i.e. not a multiple of three, or when there's a knockout of 21 base pairs or more. The editing efficiency was very high in both cell lines, and the figures show that there was successful gene knockout across all of the samples. The results from the two earlier time points show that some editing had already occurred, but in a slightly lower percentage of the cell population. So this here is an example of the example trace of the contributions of the different indels seen in the A1 knockout in the 231 cells. As you can see, the indel tab shows the size of the fragment deletions for the two editing outcomes that were present in this knockout. The contributions tab shows the percentage of the edited cells that either had a fragment deletion of 63 base pairs or of 62 base pairs. There are only two editing outcomes here but there can be a greater variety of editing outcomes in less efficient knockouts. So next, I, went, I carried out um, Western blot analysis to determine the protein expression 48 hours post-gene knockout. The mock controls shown in red are the wild-type cells that were electroporated to account for any cell death caused by electroporating the cells. The results shown here are for the 231 cells. As you can see in the graph on the left, the expression of the A1 protein was reduced in the A1 knockout shown in blue and in the double knockout shown in purple. On the right, we see the expression of the A2 protein was greatly reduced in the A2 knockout shown in pink and again in the double knockout shown in purple. We also observe an increase in the expression of the A2 protein following A1 knockout, 
as shown here in blue. This is consistent with results that have been published in the literature. The results shown here are for the MCF7 CRISPR edited cells. The results show a similar pattern to the 231 knockout cells with a slightly more efficient decrease in protein levels following knockout of both target genes. So next, to determine the effects of knocking out A1 and A2, I carried out various phenotypic assays. So when I carried out the initial CRISPR experiment, I transferred cells from each condition of the 12 well plates to, the to a 96 well plate. I then added cell tox screen to enable cytotoxicity to be measured in real time on the Incosite S3 imager for six days, while cell confluency was also monitored. At the end of the six days, I carried out the cell cytoglow cell viability assay. So these images were taken on the Incosite S3 imager six days post gene editing. And the top images are representative of the mock cells, whereas the cells, pictures on the bottom are representative of the double knockout cells. And as you can see, the cell confluency was greatly reduced following double knockout in both breast cancer cell lines. Using the data from the ink site, I generated cell growth and endpoint cell death graphs. In blue, we can see that a knockout of A1 alone impaired cell growth in both, impaired cell growth in both breast cancer cell lines. We also see that cell growth was more impaired following A1 knockout in the MCF7 cells. Knocking out A2, as shown in pink, was shown to have little effect on cell growth in either cancer cell line. This indicates that A2 is not essential for cancer cell survival or cell growth. This agrees with the findings from the DEPMAP CRISPR genomic dependency screen, which reports A2 as non-essential in both T31s and MCF7s. It also reports that MCF7s have a higher dependency on A1 for survival than the T31 cells. Interestingly, when both A1 and A2 are knocked out, as represented by the purple lines, the effect on cell growth is similar to that of the lethal control PLK1. These graphs show the cell death five days post gene editing. We see a similar pattern to the cell confluency, with cell death high in the double knockout shown in purple. We also see that cell death in the A1 knockout shown in blue is higher than that of the A2 knockout shown in pink. Again, we see that cell death is most marked in, in the MCF7 cells when A1 is knocked out compared to the 231 cells. Finally, I carried out an endpoint cell cytoglow cell viability assay six days after editing the cells to confirm the results from the cell confluency and cell death data. The cell viabilities were normalized to and expressed as a percentage of the mock. The cell viability of the A2 knockouts shown in pink remains high, whilst it's greatly reduced in the double knockout shown in purple. Again, we see that the cell viability is lower in the A1 knockout shown in blue in the MCF7 cells compared to the A1 knockout in the 231 cells. So to conclude, from the sequencing data, we saw a very high editing efficiency using the CRISPR-Cas9 protocol in the two breast cancer cell lines investigated. We also conclude that our data agrees with the cancer dependency map, where we observe a greater effect on cell growth and viability from the CRISPR knockouts compared to the shRNA knockdowns. We also observe that both breast cancer cell lines investigated are reliant on EIF or A1 dependent mRNA translation for survival with a higher dependency on A1 for survival in the MCF7 cells compared to the MDA and B231 cells. Therefore, this highlights the implications of A1 inhibition in ER positive breast cancers. This indicates that the translation of mRNAs encoding oncogenic proteins may play an essential role in driving the malignant breast cancer phenotype. We saw a clear difference in the effects on cell growth, death, and viability post-gene knockout of A1 and A2, and found that the double knockout has a lethal effect in both cell lines, so bo targeting both isoforms could have therapeutic benefits in some cancers. This investigation has shown that the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing allows the easy configuration of complex cellular assays, incorporating multiple gene dependencies. And finally, we have shown that the transient lethality assay that we have developed can be used as a method to rapidly characterize a gene and its function, avoiding the long process of isolating clones 
before it is known whether the knockout of a gene is lethal to a cell. The work we've carried out has therefore been successful in supporting the ongoing effort to discover novel, potent and specific EIFRA1 inhibitors. So I'd just like to give special thanks to my supervisor Zainab for all the support she's given me on my placement year so far and as well as my uh, team manager Craig. I'd also like to thank the other members of the project team at LifeArc and the entire target validation group. And finally, I'd like to thank Synthigo for their advice and support they have provided, particularly with helping design the multi-guides and as well as the use of their ice analysis tool. And just to add that here, the Synthigo's ice analysis tool and guide design tool can be found on their website under bioinformatics. Thank you for listening and I'll accept any questions.